But before we do that, let's ask him for help. Why don't you join with me in prayer? Our loving Heavenly Father, in a world that's full of lies and deception, you have spoken your word, which is true and trustworthy. Help us, through your word, by your spirit, to understand Jesus and the difference he makes to life, relationships, and marriage. And we ask this for our good and your glory. Amen. The key to the meaning of life. The key to the meaning of life is understanding marriage. Not being married, but understanding marriage. Many single people I know understand marriage better than many married people. Jesus says in Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, that in the life hereafter, we will neither marry nor be given in marriage. Human marriage as we know it is temporary. It points away from itself to a much greater reality. At weddings, there's always lots of photos, as there was as you came in this morning. There's lots of photos, snapshots of everything, from the the dress to the hair to the food to the groom to the service uh, to, uh, to the speeches. There's photos and snapshots of everything and everyone. And yet marriage itself is a snapshot, a snapshot of something much bigger and more important. You see, human marriage is a picture of the marriage between God and his people, a snapshot of the relationship between Jesus Christ and his followers. And life, relationships, and human marriage must be understood in the light of that marriage and modeled on that marriage. Now, if you know me, you know I'm a sucker for good love story. Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, Disney's uh, The Beauty and the Beast, Elizabeth Bennet and Mr. Dar- Mr. Darcy in Pride and Prejudice, and my personal favorite, the Swamp Ogre and Princess Fiona in Shrek. I'm a sucker for a good love story. But the greatest love story is the love story between God and his people, the Bible story. And I'm going to this morning, in four episodes, unpack this love story as we weave our way through the Bible. And while we do so, we're going to see its relationship to and impact upon the relationship between a man and a woman, between husband and wife. So, the love story between God and his people. Episode 1 opens with the design. God making the world and his people. Genesis chapter 1, the start of the Bible. God speaks and the world springs into existence. Light and dark, day and night, land and sea, animals and birds, and on the sixth day man and woman. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 says, God says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. To be human, to bear God's image, means two things. First, it means to rule. God goes on in verse 26 to say, so they may rule, rule over the fish, the birds, livestock, animals, over all the creatures. And that's repeated in verse 28. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish, the birds, over every living creature. God the King, the King of the world, delegates his rule to us. He made us to rule the world under him. Secondly, bearing his image means relationship. I wonder if you picked it up in verse 26 as I read it. God says, let us make man in our image, our likeness. Who's God talking to? Himself, of course. There is plurality. God is three in one. And so God is personal and relational. Before the creation of the universe, God was alone. But he was not lonely. There was and is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons relating perfectly Loving one another. God is Trinity. God is love. One united team. Plurality, community, in unity. That's the Trinity. And so, just like him, we too are personal and relational. Made in God's image, verse 27. Made, as we're told there, male and female. Plurality, community, in unity. You and I are created to personally know God and each other 
We're created to love and be loved. And what God makes is good. Indeed, at the end, he says it is very good. It's picture perfect. A world at rest under God's rule. People in intimate relationship with him. The love story between God and his people gets off to the perfect start. And so does the love story between a man and a woman, which is woven into Genesis chapter 2 which Anthony read for us. In verse 18, God says, It's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. In other words, man can't get the job done on his own. Now, we men know that. And God says, Man can't get the job done on his own. I'll make him a teammate. And so while Adam is asleep, God takes a rib from his side and makes Eve. God makes a woman from Adam and for Adam. She's the perfect partner. Equal, but there are differences. Viva la différence. Excuse my French. They are complementary differences, aren't they? We're different, but for good reason. More than differences, there's also order. Just as there is order in the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, so there is order in humanity, specifically in marriage. Man, woman, captain, vice-captain if you want to put it in sports terms. Differences and order is there for the purpose, for the reason that you and I may serve one another, that husband and wife may serve each other on the team and together as partners in the team, in a team, serve God by ruling God's world as he wants. Now, when Adam sees Eve, it's love at first sight. Verse 23 of Genesis 2, he bursts into history's first love song. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she'll be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And then verse 24, God outlines the blueprint for marriage. Here's what's meant to happen, and in this order. Verse 24, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. First, a man leaves his parents. Men, you need to leave your parents. Secondly, a man's united to his wife. United here speaks of an unbreakable commitment, a covenant. It is to make promises to love each other for life. And third, they become one flesh, sex, which follows the commitment. God believes in sex, lots of sex, After marriage, not before. Sex doesn't create commitment. It follows commitment. But more about that next week. Come back, please. But what we've just had painted there is the first marriage ceremony. And notice verse 25. The man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. They're not embarrassed because there's nothing between them, nothing to hide. They're completely vulnerable with one another. Well, there you have it. Episode one, God's design. A perfect world in perfect relationship with God, man and woman in perfect relationship with each other. But it doesn't stay that way for long. Love soon gives way to heartache, hardship, and shame. Episode two, disaster. Genesis chapter three. Adam and Eve, instead of trusting God, they rebel and declare independence. They reject God's good loving rule. They say, we'll, we know better. We'll make our own rules. And ever since, all of us are born rebels, guilty of treason. God takes sin very seriously. There's judgment. God's relationship with his people is broken. They're kicked out of the garden. There's separation. And God files for divorce. And ultimately, there's death. Now, when our relationship with God gets broken, everything's affected, especially our relationships with one another and the relationship between a husband and wife. God's created order is turned upside down. Humanity is meant to rule the animals, and yet it's an animal, the devil in disguise, that deceives humanity. The man who's meant to lead the woman is a wimp who falls in line behind Eve. And she, instead of following, leads him astray. So you can see, instead of God, man, woman, animals, it's animal, woman, man, and God. And... When once Adam and Eve had no shame, now the first fashion accessory, the fig leaf, enables them to hide from one another. They're ashamed. 
and they fall over each other to pass the blame. The judgment of God is upon them. And the judgment of God will mean for them, both of them, hard labor. For her, in Genesis chapter 3, the focus is in childbirth, verse 16. For him, the focus is in work, verse 17 onwards. And as for their relationship, their marriage, well, a little phrase stuck in between those two, at the end of verse 16, God says to Eve, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. That's God's judgment. God's judgment means that Adam, we must be careful to understand those verses. God's judgment means that Adam will not lead with love, but he will be harsh and selfish, which is what rule here implies. And Eve won't happily follow, but will desire to seek control, which is what desire here means. It means to desire your husband's authority, to usurp his leadership, to want to be the boss. When it comes to the battle of the sexes, here, Genesis 3, is the declaration of war. Instead of marriage being a team of two cooperating, it becomes two sides competing. Instead of being marked by service and happiness, it's marked by conflict and heartache. Marriage has become a war zone. Episode 1, God's design. 2, disaster. Episode 3, redemption. When God pronounces judgment on Adam and Eve, he also graciously promises to crush Satan and rescue his people, to woo and win them back. And a few chapters later in Genesis 12, God makes a covenant with Abraham. He makes a promise, covenant, to love him and his descendants forever. A promise that includes land and a promise to make a people who will love God and bless the world. Now, in the chapters and books that follow, we see that promise worked out and expanded on, in spite of the failure of Abraham and his descendants. You see, the story of the Old Testament is the story of God's love and faithfulness. God is the ideal husband who keeps his promise, even in the face of repeated rebellion on the part of his people, who are unfaithful, who commit adultery, who run after other gods and idols. And throughout the Old Testament in the story, God promises to send someone, a Messiah, God's chosen king who will come to rule and rescue his people. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus arrives and he claims to be that Messiah. He claims to be God's son himself. He walks around the earth as if he owns the place because he does. He speaks like God, he acts like God, and he fulfills all that's prophesied in the Old Testament about the Messiah. In particular, his death. Isaiah, the prophet in the Old Testament, speaks about that Messiah in chapter 53, verse 5. And he says this, listen. He says, the servant, speaking of what's going to come, servant the Messiah, will be pierced for our sins, crushed for our evil. He will be punished to bring us peace. All of us have turned our own way, and God has placed on his servant the sins of us all. The Messiah will be pierced, crushed, punished for our sin. Through his death, we'll be healed, restored, forgiven. And the Apostle Paul picks that up and writes in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that while we were still sinners, Jesus Christ, Christ is another word for Messiah, Jesus Messiah, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus suffered and died for our sin. God's son took our place, the punishment our sin deserved. And so, because of that, an intimate relationship, a marriage between God and us is made possible. All because a divorce took place. You see, on the cross, Jesus is separated from God his Father as he bears God's anger at our rebellion. Separated So we may be united. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Redeemed, forgiven, life eternal. Through Jesus we can know God and his love. Now I only unpack that because it's got huge implications for marriage. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. That's where um, Liesel read for us. Ephesians chapter 5. And the Apostle Paul speaks here about husbands and wives. And then in that passage you will have noted that he quotes the blueprint 
from Genesis 2 of leave, be united, and become one flesh. So he repeats all of that. And then, verse 32, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32, he says, This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Jesus Christ and the church. Human marriage is a picture of a much greater reality. The real marriage, the ultimate marriage, is between God and his people, between Jesus and his followers. And that marriage, in turn, is a model for our human marriages. So verse 22, as the church submits to Jesus, its head, so wives, God wants you to submit to your husbands in everything. Now, submission isn't groveling, neither is it weakness. It is simply the opposite of trying to control trying to be the boss, which is what Eve was doing. To submit means to let your husband lead. You know who's a great example of submission? Victor Matfield. When he was Springbuck vice captain under John Smith, he was submissive. They were both equal, but Victor let John lead. He helped John lead. He supported John's leadership. A man can't get the job done on his own. We need to be a team. And differences and order are essential for a winning team. So wives, you, under God, are the vice captain. And as vice captain, you are responsible for order. The husband isn't responsible. Men don't. Be harsh. Lay down the law and dominate. It's wives who are responsible for order in marriage. And you keep the order by submitting, by helping, supporting, and following the captain. And I might add, that takes strength. What's more... A submissive wife, in God's eyes, is beautiful. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 18, Paul's writing, and he says, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting, just right, or the word beautiful in the Lord, in his eyes. You want to be attractive to God? Be submissive to your husband. And husbands, what will headship or leadership look like? Well, it certainly won't be the power trip in the way that the world thinks. Leadership is not about being served, it's about serving. Verse 25, husbands love your wives just as Jesus Christ loved the church. How did Jesus love us? Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. As Jesus laid down his life for us, so a husband is to lay down his life for his wife. Leadership is service. It's giving yourself for another. It's selfless and sacrificial. It's gentle and considerate. Which are the two other commands God gives husbands? In Colossians chapter 3 verse 19, Paul says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Be gentle. Don't rule with an iron fist. Lead with love. Gentleness, And in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, we told husbands in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives. Treat them with respect, consideration, respect. So husbands, you call to act in the best interests of your wife, not yourself. Because that's how Jesus acted. And your love is to be a picture of his love. Your marriage is a snapshot, a picture of the marriage between God and his people, Jesus and his bride. Which brings me to episode four. Design, disaster, redemption, and finally, briefly, return. Jesus will return as judge for those who reject him. And for those who submit to Jesus King, he'll return, he'll come as a bridegroom to claim his bride. At the end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, we're given a glimpse into heaven. And what we see... Chapter 21, verse 2 is, listen to this, a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And in a couple of chapters earlier, in chapter 19, verse 6, we, see, we read this. The people are shouting, Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us be joyful and glad and give him glory, for it's time for the Lamb's wedding, Jesus' wedding. His bride has made herself ready. Jesus is returning as the bridegroom for his bride. All those who've submitted to Jesus as king, who know and love him. There'll be no human marriage as we know it in heaven. 
but there'll be something far greater. We'll be married to Jesus. And that's the marriage that really, really matters. And it's the only marriage that's guaranteed to live happily ever, ever after. The Bible pictures heaven most often as a wedding banquet, a wedding reception, an eternal celebration, a permanent party. And so, in closing, I want to say that to this heavenly wedding, we're all invited. And we'll be there at the wedding. More so, we'll be the bride if, and only if, we respond to the invitation. There's going to be one big party. You don't want to miss it. And if you do miss out, you'll only have yourself to blame. But if you're there, you'll only have Jesus to thank. Jesus died for you, that you might live. Jesus invites you into relationship with himself. Jesus makes you a marriage proposal. Will you say yes? Will you submit to Jesus as your king, captain, leader? And so, to those here who are not yet followers of Jesus, I urge and encourage you to worship Jesus, to submit to him as king, as your ultimate leader and captain. And to those who already follow Jesus, I urge and encourage us to worship Jesus in our marriage, to, as you submit to King Jesus, to model your marriage after the great eternal heavenly marriage, Jesus Christ and his bride. Let Jesus to your marriage bring healing, hope, and indeed holiness. Let's pray. Lord God, we, we pray for all of us this morning. We pray that we would indeed worship Jesus, that we would recognize him as king and submit to him. And we praise you for your love your amazing love, your grace, that Jesus would die for us and offer us forgiveness and an intimate relationship with himself forever. We praise you, we worship you, and we pray for all of us that in our relationships we would honor Jesus Christ and model his self-giving love. And we pray for husbands and wives this morning, that until Jesus returns or as long as we live, may our marriages be reflections of and a witness to the real heavenly marriage between God and his people and Jesus Christ and his followers. And Lord, we pray for marriages that might be hurting. We pray that you'd bring healing, that you'd bring hope, that you would turn each of us, husbands and wives, back to the cross, that that is where we meet and find forgiveness, both in you and from each other. And we pray that in all these things, it would be to your praise and honor and glory. Amen.